Well, here we go with rotational motion and conservation of angular momentum. Now, previously, we have studied circular motion, where we were concerned with a single particle uh, moving around a circular path. Now we're going to extend that to focus on uh, rotating objects such as wheels, axles, and spinning tops. Objects such as those whose shape does not change as they rotate are called rigid bodies. Earth, for example, is uh, an example of a rigid body. Shape does not change as it rotates. So we're going to be focusing on the first the kinematics and then the dynamics, so the, the description of, ro of rotation motion and then the forces involved in rotation motion as we move along. And we're going to find that rotational motion is analogous to the physics of linear motion that we studied in uh, the beginning of the year. So, let's get going. As I said, uh, a rigid body is an extended object whose size and shape does not change as it moves. So, for example, this bicycle tire is a rigid body. Its shape and size does not change as it rotates around. Now, there are three basic types of motion. First, there's what's called translational motion, which is the kind of motion we've been looking at for most of the course so far. Uh, translational motion is sliding type of motion. The object as a whole moves along a, tra a trajectory but does not rotate. Then there's rotational motion. In rotational motion, the object rotates around a fixed point, and every point of that object moves in a circle. And then there's a combination of that, and a lot of motions are, most motions are really a combination of translational and rotational motion, where the object will rotate as it flies through the air, for example. Okay, so here we have a rotating object. It's a wheel on an axle. Now we notice that as this wheel rotates for any time interval, the two points on the wheel uh, turn through the same angle even though their distance from the center, from the axis of rotation, is different. The result of this is that the two points have equal angular velocities. And remember that the uh, symbol for angular velocity is that Greek letter omega. So then, in general, we can say that every point on the wheel undergoes circular motion with the same angular velocity. Now remember, when we talked about circular motion, we said that the velocity of a particle in circular motion is equal to the angular velocity times the distance from the center. Meaning that two points on a rotating object will have different speeds if they have different distances from the axis of rotation, but all points on that rotating object have the same angular velocity. The angular velocity then is one of the most important parameters in rotating objects. Now, because every point on that rotating object moves in a circle, we can carry forward all the results from circular motion into this rotational motion. So that the angular displacement of any point on the wheel is found from this equation here. And because the speed of any particle on that wheel is equal to V equals omega R, then where, where R is the particle's distance from the axis, then we'll get the particle's centripetal acceleration as omega squared R. And so I encourage you to go back and review really quick that stuff from uh, circular motion, especially the, the centripetal acceleration, which is V squared over R. Take a minute and see how that becomes uh, omega squared R uh, from that derivation. So suppose you have a bicycle wheel and you push on the edge of it and it begins to rotate. If you continue to push, it rotates faster and faster. That means its angular velocity is changing. So to understand the dynamics of rotating objects, we're going to need to be able to describe a case of changing angular velocities. That would be non-uniform circular motion then. So changing angular velocity would be a final angular velocity minus an initial angular velocity. Now remember, the, in the case of linear motion, acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over time. In the same way, uh, angular acceleration is the change in angular velocity over time. And we use the Greek letter alpha to uh, indicate angular acceleration. 
And because the units of angular velocity are in radians per second, the units of angular acceleration are in radians per second squared. So by definition, the rate, the angular acceleration is the rate of change of angular velocity. And in SI units, it's measured in radians per second squared and is shown by the Greek letter alpha. Now, just like with linear velocity, an acceleration can be positive or negative. And it's not necessarily positive when speeding up and negative when slowing down. It also depends on the direction on which things are rotating. So angular acceleration is positive when that rigid body is rotating counterclockwise and speeding up. And it's also positive when it's rotating clockwise and slowing down. Angular velocity is negative when the rigid body is rotating counterclockwise and slowing down or rotating clockwise and speeding up. And so now here we see some analogies between linear and circular motion variables. In our linear motion, we can talk about position. In circular motion, we can talk about angular position. With velocity, in linear motion, we'll talk about velocity. Circular motion and rotation, we can talk about angular velocity. We can talk about acceleration with linear motion. We can talk about angular acceleration with circular motion. Now, one thing to really keep in mind here, too, is, is don't confuse angular acceleration with centripetal acceleration. The angular acceleration indicates how rapidly the angular velocity is changing. The centripetal acceleration is a vector quantity that points toward the center of a particle's circular path. And it's, it's non-zero even if the angular velocity is constant. So centripetal acceleration is something that comes about because of a changing direction of an object moving in a circular path. Whereas angular acceleration is uh, due to the changing angular velocity. Now just as there are analogs uh, of the uh, different variables between linear motion and circular motion, there are also analogs uh, uh, between the kinematic equations of linear motion and circular motion. So we'll have displacement at a constant speed here. We have angular displacement at constant angular speed here. We have change in velocity at a constant acceleration. We have change in angular velocity at constant acceler angular acceleration. And we have a displacement at constant acceleration. We have an angular displacement at a constant angular acceleration. So paying attention to these analogs to linear motion with circular motion rotation is something that you're going to want to do. Again, as we've previously talked about, a particle that undergoes uniform circular motion has an acceleration that's directed inward toward the center of the circle. And we call that a centripetal acceleration, or AC. The centripetal acceleration, remember, is, ch is due to the change in the direction of the particle's velocity and that the magnitude of centripetal acceleration is v squared over r, or omega squared r. Now, in cases where the particle's circular motion is not uniform, when the, when the particle's speed is changing, then the particle will have another component to its acceleration that we call its tangential acceleration. Because the magnitude of the velocity is increasing or decreasing, the second component of this acceleration, the tangential acceleration, is directed tangentially to the circle in the same direction as the velocity. This component then is called tangential acceleration, meaning that the full acceleration of an object going, uh, going around in a circle is the vector sum of those two components, the centripetal acceleration and the tangential acceleration. The tangential acceleration measures the rate at which the particle speed increases. So its magnitude is v squared, is change in velocity over time. And we can relate the tangential acceleration to the angular acceleration by using the relation v equals omega r between the speed of a particle moving in a circle of some radius and its angular velocity. So if the tangential acceleration is equal to the change in linear velocity over time and that linear velocity is omega r, we end up having omega, the change in uh, angular velocity over time times the radius. Now immediately we should recognize that this change in angular velocity over time is the angular acceleration so that the 
tangential acceleration is equal to the angular acceleration times the distance from the center. Now we've seen that all points on a rotating rigid body have the same angular acceleration, but from this equation, the tangential acceleration of a point on a rotating object depends on the point's distance from the axis, so that that tangential acceleration is not the same for all points. Okay, and so from here we can really see this connection between uniform circular motion and rotational motion. Okay, so what we've talked about so far is really the kinematics of rotational motion. Now we need to move into talking about torque or the dynamics of rotational motion. Here we have a top-down view of a door. Here's the hinge over here, the handle would be over here. There's four forces acting on the door and they all have the same strength, but they're each going to have different effects on that door. F1 will open the door very easily. It's pushed, that force is applied far away from the hinge. Where the handle is, we open the door fairly easy. Force two, which is uh, directed along the, the, directly toward that hinge, is not going to open the door at all. It's not going to rotate that door. Force three will open the door, but it's going to open it much more slowly. And force four will probably open the door, but it's going to open it really slowly. We notice from these that force one and force four are both perpendicular to the door. However, they both have uh, different effects on opening the door. Force three is not perpendicular to the door and it's not as easy to open that door as force one. And uh, force two doesn't open the door at all. So the ability of a force to cause a rotation or a twisting motion depends on three factors. The size of the force, the distance from the pivot point to where that force is applied, and the angle at which that force is applied. These three observations can be summarized into a single quantity that we call torque. Torque is uh, uh, symbolized by the Greek letter tau, looks like that. And torque is the rotational equivalent of force. So while forces can cause objects to slide, uh, torques will cause objects to rotate. So now here we have a wrench, right? Uh, and that ro wrench will rotate and, and turn things. As it rotates things, it will rotate around a pivot point. And the distance from that pivot point to the point where the uh, force is applied is called the radial line or line of action. Now, if a force is applied onto a, uh, an object and causes it to rotate, you're going to get the greatest amount of torque when that force is perpendicular to that radial line, when it's perpendicular to that line of action. If the force ventures away from perpendicular, then the, then the amount of torque you're going to get is less. Also, if you move closer to that radial, uh, that pivot point, you're going to get less torque. If you move further away from that, uh, that pivot point, you're going to get more torque. So then torque is the result of the perpendicular component of the force that's applied to that rotating object. Our equation for torque then is the force times the distance from uh, the pivot point times the sine of the angle between the force and that radial line. That would be this angle right here. Now the perpendicular distance from this line to the pivot point is called the moment arm or lever arm. Okay, and obviously if the, the force that's being applied is completely perpendicular to that lever arm, then, then you're just going to use that full force and you wouldn't even need to calculate the sine of an angle, right? You'd be, be looking for that perpendicular force. Now, if you've ever ridden a bicycle, right, you've experienced uh, some torques. It's because of torque that it's more difficult to get a bicycle moving if the pedals are in this uh, up position right here, when the pedals are at their highest position uh, shown here. Now, the reason it's difficult to get a bicycle going when the pedal is in that position is because the force that you apply is almost straight down toward that pivot point meaning there's very little force being applied perpendicular to uh, that lever arm, and you're not going to get any torque out of it. Now, torque is another vector quantity, so it has a sign. It has a direction. A torque that tends to rotate an object in a counterclockwise direction is positive, 
and the torque that tends to rotate an object in the clockwise direction is negative. And this here picture summarizes some of the stuff about torque, where pushing straight at the pivot point produces zero torque. A maximum positive torque for a force is perpendicular to the radial line. So if it will rotate in this counterclockwise direction, that is a uh, positive torque. If it is, would rotate in a uh, clockwise direction, that's a negative torque. Uh, and, and the torque gets less if we uh, move, if we angle away from that lever arm. So now what we've talked about here is how to calculate the torque due to a single force acting on an object. Now gravity though does not act on a single point on an object. It pulls downward on every particle that makes up that object. Uh, and so for each particle then experiences a small torque due to the force of gravity that acts on it. So gravity is pulling down on every particle of you. So each particle of you experiences a small torque right? Uh, what we can do, though, is add up all of those torques, and we get a net torque that acts at a single point that we call the center of gravity. The center of gravity, then, is also a balance point on an object. If you were to throw a baseball, for example, a baseball can follow a nice arc because its center of gravity is right in the middle of that object, okay? So that object follows a, a parabolic path. If you don't have a uniform object though, if you've got an object that has a weighted end on one end, right? Its balance point is that center of gravity, okay? Uh, and it's going to be closer to that heavier end. However, like this hammer here, right? So it's center of gravity or it's balance point, also called center of mass. Center of mass and center of gravity are basically the same thing. Uh, it's only when objects get really, really big that the center of mass is different than the center of gravity. Like um, the, the, the Sears Tower in Chicago, uh, its center of mass is actually like a, a millimeter or two below its center of gravity or something like that. So uh, the center of mass and center of gravity for objects on Earth are basically the same thing. Okay. Now, if you were to take this hammer and you were to toss it through the air, it's going to rotate. It's going to flip around as it moves through the air. But if we could track its center of gravity, that center of gravity will follow that parabolic path just like the baseball. Now, there, there's in order to find the center of gravity of an object, then, if it's a uniform object, say it's a, a meter stick, right, and I have nothing hanging on the meter stick, I can balance the meter stick right at 50 meters. It's a uniform object. But if it's a non-uniform object, in order to find that center of gravity, you could uh, take that object and, and hang it from a point, right? And then uh, if you were to hang a plumb bob, uh, from that. It's just basic, a plumb bob is just a piece of string with a weight at the end of it. And if you were to hang that from that pivot point, okay, that plumb bob will, the, the center of gravity of that object is directly below that pivot point somewhere. So then what you do is you, you draw a line on the object and then you turn the object and you hang it from another point and then uh, the plumb bob will hang directly below, the, the center of gravity will be directly below where that uh, pivot point is, and so you hang a plumb bob there, and uh, you, you find the center of gravity. And the points where they intersect that point will be the center of gravity. This picture here shows this bottle, this wine bottle, being uh, balanced because the, the wine holder has its center of gravity then over uh, this this base of support. So the center of gravity of this whole system is right in here. The leaning tower of Pisa, right, does not fall over because its center of gravity is over its base of support. So it doesn't fall over. Objects will topple if their center of gravity moves outside that base of support. So if that thing were to ever lean to a point where that center of gravity is, is outside its base of support, yeah, the thing's gonna fall right over, okay? And here we see a, a, a nice little treatment of how to calculate uh, an object's center of gravity. And your textbook goes into a really nice explanation of how uh, that comes about. Okay, so we'll talk briefly in class about center of gravity um, and, and look at some really wonderful uh, center of gravity demonstrations and whatnot. Uh, see you in class.